Bt toxin, which is used in some GMO crops, pokes holes in insects to kill them. Is there any reason to be concerned that GMOs that have Bt toxin may be dangerous to humans? I think so. What do you think? 2012 Journal of Applied Toxicology, they applied some Bt toxin to human cells, and guess what? The same holes that, the, that gets drilled into the gut walls of insects happen in human cells. Yes, also Bt toxin does evoke immune and allergic responses in humans and mice. So we think it's extremely dangerous. I believe it is probably creating leaky gut inside the cells, whereas Roundup creates leaky gut between the cells. Not a good combination. And Bt toxin was found in the blood of 93% of the pregnant women tested in Canada and 80% of their unborn fetuses. Since it's a hole poking toxin in fetuses, there's no blood-brain barrier there. It might be poking holes in the brains of these fetuses. We don't know. But it's not something we should be experimenting with. It's also toxic to red blood cells, and it's in the blood supply. How did it get in the blood supply? Possibly through the holes that it creates. Now, if 93% of the pregnant women tested have Bt toxin in their blood, why is that? It's not Mexico where they eat corn tortillas every day. It should wash out rather quickly. So the authors of the study surmised that it was eating the meat from animals that ate Bt crops their whole lives. But there's another possible explanation. If the gene that produces the Bt crop were to transfer from corn where it can, is contained, into the DNA of bacteria living in our guts. And if that gene were to continue to function, it might be producing the Bt toxin from within, from within our own gut bacteria. And that may be why 93% of the pregnant women tested in Canada have Bt toxin in their blood. Is it possible for genes to transfer to gut bacteria in the only human feeding study on a current GMO ever tested? They found that it did. Part of the gene that creates Roundup Ready Soy ended up integrated into human gut bacteria. They found that. We don't know if it was continuing to function. No one tested the Bt toxin. But that would be very serious if we're colonizing the gut flora of this generation with bacteria that creates an insecticide that pokes holes in guts and creates immune system reactions. You mentioned your movie Secret Ingredients. Can you tell us just a little bit more about what that was all about? When I produced and directed the film Genetic Roulette, so many people changed their diet. It was seen about 2 million times online. It was played on PBS stations over 300 times. And people would stop eating GMOs, and they would report to me by tens, hundreds, that they would feel better, that their diseases would go away, that their kids stopped acting out, they were, they were no longer to be kicked out of school, you know, really serious changes. And those reports, I was feeling a little pressure because I was getting them all, maybe more than anyone on the planet, and I wanted to share them. And it was far more convincing to have those reports over and over again to get more and more people to stop eating GMOs and to eat organic. So we went, I went to a chiropractic conference to speak, and I announced from the podium, we have a video camera here, and my partner Amy Hart, uh, we want to videotape anyone that has a story about avoiding GMOs and getting better. And Kathleen DiChiara came and said, I had, my family had 21 chronic conditions between the five of us. My son was autistic and this and this and this. I was disabled, unable to work, started experimenting with food, became uh, a student of, of food, and did 1,700 hours of study, and, and then listened to 800 hours of interviews, and you know, read, all these things. And I started experimenting on the family and taking out gluten and taking out this and all that. And we got a little better, but it wasn't until we went organic that all the problems went away. We went, oh my God, this is the story we need to cover. Then in comes in Dr. Marsha Schaefer. She runs a chiropractic clinic. All these in infertile couples come. There was over 50 of them. They went through a protocol. They all have kids now. Now it's 123, but at the time it was in the 50s. She became another person in our, in our film. And there was another couple we found later. Their son was autistic. Their daughter had, autism, had, had asthma. And they switched to organic, and the son is no longer on the spectrum, and the daughter no longer has asthma. All of these things, over and over again. And we had um, doctors like Dr. David Perlmutter say, this is why it happens to the gut bacteria. Doctors like 
pediatrician Michelle Perro. This is what I'm seeing in my clinic. Then we had scientists speaking. We had animation. We put the whole thing together, and it was emotionally driven stories with scientific understanding that gave people permission to believe what was actually happening in the people. And the combination has become the most successful conversion tool to organic. And what do we hear now? I saw your film, changed my diet, you saved my life. We hear that all the time. And every time I show it, I showed it today to a theater near here. And I asked the question, how many people, first question I asked before I answered any other questions after the showing, how many people have already decided to eat more organic in their life? All but two people's hands went up. I didn't ask them why I didn't put them on the spot. Maybe they were already 100%. And then I said, how many people have already thought of someone they want to share the film with? And nearly every hand went up. So it's a very powerful secret ingredients movie is where you can see it, or on iTunes or Google Play. But go to Secret Ingredients Movie, put down your name. We're, gonna hel we're helping people switch to organic more and more as we get tips and tricks and things that we can help so that people's transition to organic lifestyle is less expensive, funner, and easier. Have there been tests on which foods have the most glyphosate on them? In fact, we've compiled all those tests. See, the FDA is supposed to compile it for all these different herbicides and whatnot. But for some reason, they don't do Roundup. It's like that's the one they don't do. They don't do glyphosate residues. So independent groups have done it. We've put them all together in one report. It's available at responsibletechnology.org. Both the raw ingredients, as well as processed foods, as well as dog foods and cat foods, wine, beer, et cetera. You said that glyphosate is an endocrine disruptor what does that mean, and how does that affect our health? Well, we don't know if low dose, tiny doses, cause the endocrine disruption. We're not sure. Low doses caused non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I mean, tiny amounts, parts per trillion. We don't know if it was an endocrine disruption or something else. But we do know that glyphosate can mess up aromatase. Aromatase determines the balance between estrogen and testosterone. So that's important. And so there's the opportunity, the possibility, that throwing off our hormones can mess up a lot of things. And it's not just hormones. It's also neurotransmitters, like serotonin, dopamine, and melatonin. And those are created from the precursors called aromatic amino acids. And those are produced by gut bacteria through a pathway called shikimate pathway, which is disabled by glyphosate. So do the math. When people stop. When people switch to organic, their mood issues, depression, anxiety, their pain, Parkinson's, different things get better that are linked uh, causally to these neurotransmitters. You know, sl sleep problems. A lot of people, they get better from sleep. They get better, they have less insomnia and other sleep disorders. Melatonin comes from the same pathways. And if there's not enough melatonin, we have a problem with sleep and other things because melatonin is really important for the brain. So. Uh, these delicate mechanisms are being smashed by glyphosate. Can you sum up everything we've talked about tonight in 15 seconds? Eat organic, tell others about it, and contribute to the Institute for Responsible Technology. What's the one thing I must do today? Having heard this, I've been involved in behavior change messaging for a quarter of a century helping people make healthier choices. And your question is excellent. What can you do today? That's actually the answer. To ask the question, what can I do today? Not tomorrow. Not 10 minutes or 20 minutes or hours after you hear this information. But what can you do now? For some, it's getting to what I call the cupboard stage, where they literally throw out everything that's not organic. Not everyone has the ability to do that. But people have the ability to make a commitment. For example, a commitment could be, I want to spend a month going organic, and I want to take notes. I want to know what my mood is, my energy level, and every symptom rated 1 to 10, and what percentage of organic I'm eating every day, comparing it to that. So I want to know for sure what a difference in organic diet would make. Maybe some people will commit to cooking every Sunday enough food for the rest of the week to put it in the freezer or the refrigerator or maybe get together with their friends, whatever it is. That's the question. What can I do today? Let's make it more narrow 
what could you do now, now that you know? And it could be about yourself. It could be about getting information out. It could be about making a donation. But the key is, as you said, today, now. Why do you feel it's so important for you to come here to speak at the Real Truth About Health Conference? I enjoy the fact that you make the answers to my questions available to so many people. That's actually part of our mission. Knowledge has organizing power. It's pretty clear that when we educate people about the dangers of GMOs, they try to change their diet, and most are successful, and that changes the entire food supply. Now we have to get the word out about protecting nature from being replaced by gene-edited organisms. It's all based on education. So this is an educational platform. An advantage that I have every time I come, and I've been to every one of them, is I get to meet colleagues. Because they often bring all the GMO people together in the same couple of days. I know most of the people who are coming to speak, and I get enjoy the pe meeting the people that I hadn't met, and we get to share information, do live Facebooks, etc. So it's really fun and very valuable. Trying to protect the planet from the replacement of nature by a corrupted gene pool. I'm looking to all sources, including indigenous wisdom, indigenous leaders. I was meeting in Hawaii with someone who had worked with indigenous peoples for decades. And he told me a story. He said in 1991, he was sitting with a, a Hawaiian elder who had his eyes closed. And he said, I want you to get a group together in 1990 blank, and 1990 blank, and 1990 blank, to start preparing. But do it before 2000, because there'll be an event that'll make it very difficult to have progress. And then 2015 or 17, get your, get your group and catch the world as it falls, and stand it up in a good way. If you're successful, you'll have 2,000 years of peace. If you're not, it will be the end of biological evolution as we know it. When he said the end of biological evolution as we know it, I realized that that expression was the most accurate expression of replacement of nature of eliminating the products of the billions of years of evolution and replacing it with laboratory creations that are prone to side effects. And I realized that this Hawaiian elder probably wasn't talking about something else, because there's nothing else that fits that bill so perfectly as what I'm working on. So I, first of all, I didn't feel quite so alone, supported by a Hawaiian elder, indigenous people. But it also left open the other question. If we protect the world, why would we have 2,000 years of peace? Is it that there's something else coming that will give us 2,000 years of peace, but only if we can protect nature? It's still worth to protect nature, yeah. Or is even the process of protecting nature going to contribute to that? And I asked a Hawaiian elder when I was there, a different one, about the Hawaiian understanding of the exchange between humans and nature. And he talked about aloha aina. Aina is the environment, but it's not just some distant thing. It's beloved. And there's an aloha aina is this reciprocity between nature and man. So I thought, well, that's interesting. If we protect nature, if we teach people to honor nature and understand that the intelligence of nature is supreme and give nature the opportunity to express herself, are we going to develop and incorporate the orderliness, the harmony that nature has? Is there going to be an aloha aina, a reciprocity, so that we can help better establish our 2,000 years of peace as a blessing from nature who we've stepped forward to protect? I don't know, but I like the story. 
And it's worth doing. It's worth protecting biological evolution as we know it. And to hope that we end up with 2,000 years of peace. And why not love nature and honor nature and consider nature sacred as part of the teaching that we do now to protect her, all living beings, and all future generations. In fact, some may think of this as a duty that they have to bear. I think of it as an opportunity. Think about it. No previous generation could ever have protected all living beings and all future generations because previous generations did not have technologies that could destroy or damage all living beings and all future generations. So we have something to do as humans now in this generation that sets us apart from the human race that has come before. We get to be the protectors of everything. This stepping up as the human species in the right way could also propel us towards 2,000 years of peace. Let's try it.